The topic is uh, conservation return on investment. And just to be clear on what we're talking about here, um, when we conserve or manage natural resources, we can think of that delivering a set of returns. So this is a partial list of the kind of things we would mean by returns. You can think of these as the objectives biophysically of what we're doing. We're trying to enhance biodiversity, generate food, generate better health outcomes, provide beauty, um, those kinds of things. And so you can think of those as the conservation returns um, we get from either conservation, protection, or management. And then the economic returns are the social value of those things. I'm actually not going to talk as much about the economic returns today. Um, we're going to focus on the conservation returns. Um, so why do this? Why bring this mindset um, to conservation planning? And the real reason is because we don't have infinite amounts of money. If you're the Nature Conservancy or WWF or the state of Idaho, um, you just don't have that much money um, you can spend on conservation. And so given that you're constrained, how do you get the most conservation you can? And this is about protecting as much as you can, for goodness sake. Um, and so economics can help with this, and uh, in fact has helped quite a bit. I'm going to start with the simplest possible version of this return on investment idea. And here, all we're doing is we're thinking about a single objective. I think the most common one in the conservation community going back decades is biodiversity protection and enhancement. So it's a single objective. Let's imagine for the moment we have a good way of measuring that. That's going to be an interesting thing to talk about. How do we actually measure that? And the only thing we're going to add to that is we're going to think about the costs of achieving protection. Um, and conservation. This is a picture um, that kind of gets at the, the most basic intuition here. And this is a study that Amy Ando and three other co-authors um, published in Science in 1998. And um, what it's showing is basically what they're doing is they're comparing what they call the site minimizing solution. So we want to protect. Um, a certain number of species. And the yellow and green boxes are showing you what you would do is if you were to get that number of species protected on the smallest amount of land. So you can almost think about the green and the yellow as being the hot spots, the biodiversity hot spots. And then what they do is they say, well, let's not approach conservation that way. Let's actually think about how the price of the land affects what we can do here. And how would that change our conservation strategy? And so the blue and the green now represent the lands that you would invest in um, to conserve species. And what they basically are showing in this picture is you get the same number of species if you consider costs for 30% of the price of that sort of hotspot or site minimizing strategy. It's a pretty basic intuition. You, if you look at those yellow lands in particular, where are they? The Bay Area. <laughs> yeah, and the coasts. What do we know about the coasts? People like to live there. Yeah, which means land's really expensive. So. That's the basic intuition. Whereas you start moving out into the sand hills of Nebraska or rural Montana, the land's a lot cheaper. So basically, you can protect a lot more land, which may, from a biodiversity perspective, you know, per acre not be as rich or ecologically valuable, but you can just buy a lot more of the land. Okay, so pretty simple intuition. I will point out that this paper came out not that long ago. I mean, 17 years ago doesn't seem long to me, but, uh, um, and this was slightly mind-blowing. Again, this got published in Science and stirred up the conservation community. Kind of seems obvious now, um, but it's, it's stimulated dozens and dozens and dozens of papers about kind of taking what they've done here and doing it in a more sophisticated way. Um, 
And so it's intellectually a really kind of uh, fruitful area in conservation science. Another way of looking at this is, so what we were doing in that, what they were doing in this study is they were trying to fix the number of species and the question is, can we get that same number more cheaply? Another way of flipping this, it's kind of the same issue, in, um, is to say for a given budget, you have $10 million, um, how, how many more species can you protect? And I've just pulled out some headlines here from some of the studies. One of the readings, you know, is this survey of this literature. And um, so these are just give you a sense of the magnitude. You know, for a given budget, just by considering costs, um, you can protect 32 to 69 percent more, three times more, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So um, again, this is kind of really stimulated thinking in the conservation community about where and how they should conserve, um, just by thinking about the cost side. So an important note here is there's no economics here really in this kind of thing yet, except costs matter. Um, now, for those of you who are ecologists and biophysically oriented, there's a lot of simplification that's going on here. Um, so this outcome measure, species protected, like is that really what we want to do? Or don't the species themselves matter? You know, which ones are more important than others? We're not actually valuing the species. And so in effect, what you're assuming here is all species are created equal. Um, and maybe you wouldn't want to make that assumption. Another thing this talk's going to emphasize is how dependent this kind of economic perspective is on what you do in ecology. And um, so one of the things that, you know, again, we can only help you with what you give us. And so a lot of this work goes at these things like habitat quality, the relationship between the area conserved and either the diversity of species or the abundance of species as a function of that area, um, predation, et cetera, how do species interact, that's real and matters and you'd like to be able to figure out how to build that into the outcome measure. And then this thing like contiguity and connectivity, can we, we want to plan, obviously, to think about migration and things like that. Um, so all of these ROI analyses do a relatively good or a relatively bad job of kind of building in that ecological realism. Um, and luckily, we as economists don't have to worry about that. You have to worry about that. Um, so there's some variations to this, just to point out. Um, you can do this ROI analysis before the fact in order to help you plan what you want to do. And that's what I'm going to be using as illustration today. You can also do it after the fact and think about that as a you know, performance evaluation and an experiment. And people do this as well. Like, let's actually think about the returns we got given an intervention or a conservation action. Another th question is, I gave you this example of a single objective, biodiversity, um, but what's kind of hot now is to um, think about multiple returns, so not just biodiversity, but what land should we protect if we want carbon sequestration also or other ecosystem benefits. Um, and then the, sorry, I got these out of order, but, and then are we looking at a single one-off investment or are we looking at a portfolio of investment um, and doing the planning and targeting? And the th stuff I've highlighted in green is what I'm going to illustrate in what. So think about the Nature Conservancy. They've got a budget. How should they spend that budget across the landscape, given that they care about biodiversity and other things? Um, so this is a more complicated version, complicated in the sense that we're going to focus on more, more than just one objective. Okay, and this is a real example. USAID gave the Nature Conservancy $30 million um, to invest in forest conservation in Mexico. And the question is, where should they spend that $30 million? And the other thing we kind of knew from what TNC and USAID and the Mexican government's objectives were is, 
we're going to care about three things, carbon sequestration, biodiversity protection, and water provision, water availability primarily. So this is a concrete question. So what would we like to know? Yeah, how to weight those three objectives. How to weight the objectives, very good. Yes. What's the universe of possible options to start with? Yep, very good. In fact, thank you. I'm going to go to that one first. Excellent, excellent gold star. Yeah, what, let's start with what can we actually do on the land? Um, and w we can protect forests, obviously, from conversion to other land uses. Um, that's really what's going to be in play in this example. In other contexts, we can think about how to manage forests differently, for example. We could even try to reclaim agricultural land and reforest. But just you know, going forward here, what we're really focusing on is protecting forests that already exist. Step one is we need to figure out how to think about the cost of doing this protection. And yesterday we talked about opportunity costs. If, if you keep the land in forests, what benefits are you foregoing? Um, in doing that. And so one way of thinking about that is, well, again, you could convert it to agricultural land or urban land, and um, that's a, the opportunity cost of not doing that you can factor in. Basically what we do, though, is we can use a combination of land prices. Land prices are a signal of those opportunity costs. Um, or absent land prices, or as a complement to land prices, we can actually try to simulate what we think the profitability of the land would be in agriculture by thinking about what kind of yields you're going to get, what kind of costs agriculture entails, and in effect try to mimic the, the profitability of those lands and other uses. Um, okay, what else do we want to know? This is the big kahuna. What does conservation actually get you? right, ecologists. Um, so I'm going to protect this forest. So I need to be able to map that forest cover into some sequestration function. Um, I've described these as deltas here. Again, it's the marginal impact of this protection relative to the alternative on these outcomes. That's what we really care about. So we need some measure of the biophysical lifts here. How much carbon is this going to sequester relative to if we didn't protect? How much more water quantity are we going to get? How much more biodiversity? Um, and then what we could do uh, is get at the social benefit of those deltas in some of the ways that Pete described. Um, but this is, this is a big part of the challenge, is actually doing those biophysical mappings, figuring out those functions. And um, the term we use, many ecologists use, is this about ecological production functions. Um, and in effect, what you're doing is you're comparing forest to not having the forest. And then, um, again, finding that biophysical delta. So two points here. First of all, the forest, even if you don't conserve it, it can stay forest anyway. And we have to worry about that problem. Um, and so one of the things about doing this return on investment analysis is um, we, in effect, need to calculate the probability we think that forest will convert to another type of land use in the absence of conservation. And we use econometrics uh, and a very, uh, various forms of data to get at this question. It, it just quickly and intuitively, it depends on things like your proximity to road networks, your proximity to uh, the ability to sell agricultural products in a market. Um, it depends on the slope of the land. Um, you know, flatter tends to be better for, for agriculture. Um, it can depend on policy variables. But basically what people are going to do here is they're going to define this conversion probability as a function of those kinds of things. It's, it's a geospatial statistical kind of analysis. Um, and so that's important. Then another thing that's important is if you conserve forest here, that can generate pressure that because of the protection to um, convert lands that weren't protected. We call this leakage. So um, we, we actually need to think about that effect going on here, too. And some of the methods that Sheila talked about yesterday, 
um, researchers use to kind of find a basically the um, a control, a fake control. What was the word you yeah. used? Yeah. Basically, you define a fake counterfactual. You look at lands that are as similar as possible to the ones you're protecting, and then you can actually tease out this kind of leakage effect. Um, so again, another thing economics is bringing to this is you've got to worry about this kind of thing if you're, you're actually going to measure the ROI. One of the mantras here is it may seem, OK, costs matter. Should we just go where the land is cheap? And the answer in general is no. Um, the reason being that when you see really cheap land, that in effect is a signal that it's unlikely to be developed. So it's, these are lands that are probably going to stay as they are, even if you don't do conservation. So it seems nice and to think like, well, let's just go where the land is cheap, and that's the answer. Um, but in general, it's actually, you don't go where they're really cheap, because again, those lands are likely to not be developed anyway, or converted anyway. And then you don't go where they're super expensive. It's somewhere in between. Oh, thanks, Joe. Um, so let's get back to this concrete question. I'm going to show you a tool and a set of models and data that are used to answer this question. Again, we have this three objective return we want to think about. OK, so how, do we, how would we jointly maximize these three things? Um, and we have this, uh, someone mentioned it to you, how do we weight um, those things, these apples and oranges and strawberries, and you know, what, what would we normally do here? We value them. You value them, right. You convert them into a common metric, dollars, and that's why Pete does what Pete does. We're not actually going to do that here, but just keep that in mind, that that's what you should, should be thinking about often. But we do have this choice, and this comes at a question that was asked at the very beginning of yesterday, which is, is there an alternative to putting dollar values on this stuff? And in effect, here's the alternative. We could, uh, as economists, we could convert carbon sequestration and biodiversity and water provision into dollar values and kind of do all your work for you, do all your thinking for you, and tell you Here's what this stuff is, is worth in relative terms. Or we could empower you to come up with your own judgment of that. And as a philosophical matter, that's kind of where I'm at these days. Um, I have found that it, it's such a heavy lift to working with conservation organizations to say, biodiversity is worth this much dollars per bunny. That just doesn't go over well, and nobody really wants that. So my thing is empowering the conservation organization to actually explore their own values and come up with their own weightings themselves. And so as a philosophical and practical matter, that's kind of what you're going to see in some of the choices we made with this tool. Um, this tool is created by um, Alan Blackman, my colleague at RFF, and um, Len Goff, um, who, who's now moved on, but is like a, a great programmer. and. And they've generated um, this management tool that's going to allow us to see some of these ROI issues in, in a real way. So I want to give credit to them. The idea here is we want people to like, look at a map and think about the choice they face, how much money they have, where they can operate in terms of conservation, and then explore these trade-offs between these different outcomes. Thinking about costs and thinking about these risks to uh, land conversion as being factored in. So there's a lot of stuff kind of under the hood here. Um, and let me talk about that. So under the hood, again, the user d doesn't have to see this if they don't want to, are these cost estimates. And so in, I'm going to show you an example from Mexico. Uh, Mexico is divided into ajitos, which are, f you can think of them as kind of almost a town or village level, smaller than a county scale administrative unit. And um, uh, Alan and the team have built in that kind of scale data on land costs. And then in other cases, actually empirically estimated these uh, opportunity costs of conservation. So again, all uh, Joe and Chris's interventions here, we do want to model this, 
risk of deforestation in the absence of any conservation. So there's data and a model underlying this here that estimates that conversion probability in the absence of conservation. And then again, we need this mapping between you protect the following forest acres, what do you get in a biophysical sense? How much more carbon sequestration? For that, it's a, a, f a fairly crude, but this is the least objectionable of these, just a function that D describes the relationship between the kind of land cover and the amount of carbon you're going to sequester. Biodiversity. Um, this is basically uh, data that, um, first of all, is crude in the sense that we're not looking at contiguity or connectivity issues. This is literally a count of species richness kind of parcel by parcel or area by area. And that's how we're picking up biodiversity. Um, water is based on a model called Water World. And um, I've read an, a little bit about this model. Basically, it's a physical hydrological model that links land use to these water outcomes. And um, it's complicated in and of itself. Um, I don't think Alan or any of the team, certainly I wouldn't defend this water model as the water model. Um, but it fit our needs here because, again, it, it maps land use, land cover into these water outcomes. Um, so we basically borrowed that model and, and, and in included it under the hood. So I'm, I'm going to attempt to show you in real time the use of the tool, um, but before doing that, Basically, there's the user, and who is the user here? Well, you can think about it as a room full of people. You know, think about people from TNC and uh, the Mexican government and um, um, Rainforest Alliance. These are real people sitting around trying to figure out how to spend that 30 million bucks or how to evaluate proposals to spend the 30 million dollars. They're not just going to pay attention to this tool. It's just one piece of information. Um, but what they can do is they can actually um, delineate on a map what the planning boundary or the boundary for action could be. It could be the whole of Latin America. It could be Mexico. It could be Chiapas. It could be, as I'll show you, you can actually choose the area. You can then type in a budget constraint. Um, how much money do you actually have to spend? Um, and then what it's going to do is it's going to allow you, the user, this group of people in a room, to actually play around with the weights. And what you're going to be able to play around with the weights, and it's going to show you which parcels are targeted as the winners or the biggest bang for the buck. And you can play with your weights. How much do I care about biodiversity versus carbon? And you can actually start seeing on a map how that those weights affect what you should be doing. And the theory here is that that's going to help you, A, are there important trade-offs here actually? And there usually are. Um, and B, given that, what do I think my weights really are? And it's, the idea is to help people discover these relative values rather than tell them what they are. And again, this is a little weird for economists to do this, but not putting dollar values on things. Um, but we're proud of ourselves. So uh, I'll show you in real time in a second. But here's just a, a part of the under the hood data, if you will. So there's this model that generates this deforestation risk in the absence of conservation. And the brighter the red, the higher the risk. And just crudely, at least, you can see that the risk it tends to follow road networks and urban areas and that kind of thing, which is intuitive. Um, Here's a static depiction of the kind of thing that goes on. Um, so the green carbon, the red biodiversity, the H water. Um, what this picture shows is the blue stuff is if I only cared about these hydrological outcomes, where I would invest. If it's pure green, that's where I would invest if all I cared about was carbon, the, the red is where I'd invest if all I cared about is biodiversity. You see 
these different colors for the Venn intersections. So this is kind of a static way of seeing how what you care about um, affects where you should be acting on the landscape. And again, if I can get the tool to work, it's going to be able to do this in a more dynamic way for you. But that's the idea. Um, and the main lesson from this particular picture is that there is some overlap. Those sweet spots are the cross-hatched white stuff. That's where you get, you don't have any trade-off at all. all th you're getting all three. So I'm going to show you this work. Before we do that, I just want to call out some limitations and weaknesses. The biophysical relationships here, um, again, the biodiversity outcome measure is very crude. The water outcome measure is disturbingly fancy. <laughs> Like, I'm looking at this, and I'm like, no way. How are you doing that? So that's my reaction anyway. Um, the spatial social outcomes are crude. So you know, a, a thing that we as economists think a lot about is you know, you're providing water, like the top of the watershed. All it's showing you is that water abundance at the top of the watershed. Well, of course, that abundance then flows down throughout the watershed. and um, this model isn't visualizing or showing you that. Um, related to the biodiversity stuff, again, it's not showing you anything about connectivity or contiguity and the way species move around and that kind of thing. Um, it's also not showing you anything about the dynamics of the problem and effect. It's not predicting. You could do this. this we just haven't done it. You could actually be talking about what we think the Mexican landscape will look like in 10 or 20 years given climate change and kind of try to re-estimate all of these things including the biophysical relationships but that's not there yet. Um, and then another important thing for both biophysical and social reasons is that return on investment in conservation is path dependent. In other words what you'd really want to do is if at the beginning you say we're going to protect this area what you've protected will then alter the return on investment to subsequent protections. And there's a literature on this, for example, but it's, it's hard to build into a model like this, and so it's not there, but so we just call it out.